in electrical engineering in, um, from Iran, and then he completed his PhD uh, in electrical and computer engineering at Flint University in Canada. He then continued his research um, in Bessie Durial Medical Center as a postdoctoral fellow working on cardiac MRI. Uh, his main research interest is on cardiac MRI, including post sequence design, motion compensation, um, image reconstruction, and registration. So, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, as Monica explained, I uh, worked at the BIDMC for three to four years, and then I joined uh, Children's Hospital uh, since last September. So most of the talk that I'm uh, giving here is about the work that I have done at the uh, BIDMC on adults. So the topic of my talk would be cardiovascular magnetic resonance imaging and emerging field in uh, uh, clinical practice. So before that, I would like just to show you the lab that uh, we are working. We are uh, located on the sixth floor of the main building at Children's uh, uh, Boston Children's Hospital. We have a 1.5 T magnet, and most of our patients are pediatrics, uh, our children's, uh, young children's, uh, infants, and no, uh, uh, neonates. Uh, so you can see we have uh, monitors here, two monitors for the uh, uh, parents to go inside. They would like to be close to their uh, children and we have an MR compatible anesthesia because the children are scared to go to the inside and we have to put them under anesthesia so we can avoid the motion artifact in our images. So it sometimes gets challenging because we have uh, two specialists uh, to put the uh, small kids under anesthesia and then to send them on their scanner to scan them for one hour to two hours. And uh, after the scan, we will wake them up and then we will send them back uh, home, hopefully safe and sound. But uh, now, most of the, my time is going to be uh, 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 about the coronary artery disease on the adults, the work that we have been done at uh, BIDMC. So coronary artery disease is the leading cause of death in the United States in, uh, in both uh, men and women. However, the increasing prevalence of coronary artery disease and reduce, uh, reduce diagnostic yield of uh, invasive approach of the of uh, of of uh, invasive extra coronary invasive extra angiography that we use to detect the coronary artery disease, it indicates for a need for a non-invasive uh, imaging modality to detect the uh, coronary artery disease or CAT. On the other hand, cardiovascular magnetic resonance imaging is a non-invasive imaging modality that not only give us information about coronary artery disease, it can have some information about the cardiac function viability, perfusion, and cardiac anatomy. And moreover, recently there has been a, a multi-center study in Japan showing that coronary MRI can detect, the, can rule out the coronary artery disease with a negative predictive value of 88%. So they scanned around 138 patients. They could complete the scan of 127 patients using coronary MRI, and they showed that the coronary MRI has a sensitivity of 88% and a specificity of 72% to detect the coronary artery disease. So as you can see, this uh, uh, sensi sensitivity and the specificity are not 100%, and also we couldn't image 10% of the patient due to the clinical challenges of the coronary MRI. So in this talk, I'll talk about those clinical challenges, and I'll try to come up with some solutions to address those challenges. The first challenge that we have is the small diameter of the coronary vessels. The coronary vessels that we are looking at is in around uh, five millimeter. So having a high resolution image is necessary to detect the coronary artery disease, which is significant, let's say, significant coronary artery disease that we are talking over 50% occlusion. And also we have uh, dealing with intrinsic cardiac motion and respiratory motion that we have to suppress during the imaging for having a very sharp images and therefore to accurately detect the coronary artery disease. So to have a high spatial resolution, the images that we are looking at is in the isotropic one millimeter uh, cube uh, uh, resolution that we would like to have for our coronary MRI. So if we have a field of view of 256 by 256 by 90 millimeter cube to cover the whole heart, to see the all branches of the coronaries, that means that I have to acquire 19 times 256K spaceline. And if I am using the steady state free precession sequence that are mostly used in coronary, coronary uh, cardiovascular imaging, that means that my TR, the acquisition, the, the time that I need for acquired one case baseline is five milliseconds. 
So 256 times 90 times 5 milliseconds is around 2 minutes. 2 minutes is a long time because I'm going to have a cardiac motion to suppress. That's kind of the motion that we are looking at, representing the cardiac, if it's going to play correctly. Yeah, hopefully. And then plus that, I'm going to have the respiratory motion to correct. During the two minutes, we cannot ask our patient to hold their breath. It's a long, it's going to be a very long breath hold. So this is time kind of a respiratory motion that we are dealing with, which is mainly translation on a long superior inferior direction. So we have to compensate for these two. So let's see how we compensate for these two motions. When we lie scan the patient, we have the ECG lead signal on the chest to trace the ECG signal of the each patient. So we take the R wave internal, R wave signal, and then we wait for the time at which the heart is very still. <coughs> it has been shown that the heart is very still during the mid yaso the time that we can image for a short period of the time. So here I'll show you the time that we can see where the heart is very still to detect the coronary artery disease. You can see the coronary artery, the cross section of the coronary artery is here. And you can see it doesn't move at the mid yaso so we have a very certain period of time between 80 millisecond to 120 millisecond to image. That means that for each cardiac cycle, I have only 100 millisecond to acquire to, or to fill up my case space data. And if my TR is 5 millisecond to have, a, for example, SSFE acquisition, that means that I can only acquire 20 case space line during this time. I cannot fill up the whole case space line. So I have to wait for another cardiac cycle and then I have to acquire the rest of my case space line, another 20 line of case space. So that even prolonged scan time, because I have to wait or average over the time to acquire the whole case space line to have a high resolution image that is preferable, preferable for coronary artery disease. Again, that means that if I have 90 times 256 case space line to acquire, and only acquire 20 case space line per cardiac cycle, that means that I have around 1,200, I need around 1,200 cardiac heartbeats or cardiac cycle to fill up our, my case space data. That means around 20 minutes of scan, which is very long, and we cannot have our children, for example, under anesthesia for 20 minutes under the scan. So the problem is more than that. So within 20 minutes, okay, patient is breathing normally, so I have a respiratory motion artifact. To compensate for respiratory motion, what we do is that we put a two-dimensional pencil beam navigator on the right hemidiaphragm to track the right hemidiaphragm motion. And if we have the right hemidiaphragm motion, we can use this as a surrogate to correct for the heart motion. So this is a signal that we get from the right hemidiaphragm. You can appreciate the long signal, which is dark in this region, and you can appreciate the signal of the right hemidiaphragm. And the red line are the tracked edge of the right hemidiaphragm from cardiac cycle to another cardiac cycle. So if I can track the right hemidiaphragm using a two-dimensional pencil beam navigator, which is usually occurred during two milliseconds, and I can process it in five milliseconds to prospectively the respiratory motion and correct for the respiratory motion of the heart. So I can move my imaging volume during the scan based on the respiratory motion of the, uh, based on the respiratory motion or the right hemidiaphragm motion. So, so we have the two-dimensional pencil beam navigator to track the respiratory motion and then we usually put a very narrow gating window of five millimeter to suppress the respiratory motion around the end expiration. So the end expiration is at the time that the heart is at the highest position. So we detect that and then we set up our gating window of five millimeter around end expiration and we monitor our acquisition data. If my 20 case space line are acquired at outside the gating window or at the beginning of the inspiration here, are going to reject the data because they are corrupted by the respiratory motion. They have not acquired at the right place. So I'm going to reacquire in the next cardiac cycle, which is going to be here. And hopefully at the time that I'm reacquiring this data at the next cardiac cycle, they're going to be acquired within the 5 millimeter gating window. So then I can suppress the respiratory motion. Basically, I'm triggering both my cardiac uh, acquisition data with my respiratory signal at the end expiration. So I'm going to repeat this acquisition until all the case baselines are fulfilled, all are completed. So this process of accept and reject is going to ex ex extend the scan time twice. That means that my 20 minutes scan is going to be 40 minutes scan. It's going to be a very long scan, 
because during the 40 minutes scan, I'm gonna have a variation in the heart rate. I'm gonna have the drift in respiratory motion that may cause the scan not to be completed. completed. That's the main reason that 10% of the patient in that multi-center study could not be finished the coronary MRI because the scan take a long time, they had to scan. They had to finish the scan due to the respiratory delay. And the motion of the patient during the 40 minutes, definitely the patient would move. So we need a new respiratory motion compensation technique that can reduce the scan time. It doesn't prolong the scan time as twice and also preserve image quality. This is the aim of this talk here. To reduce uh, the imaging time, we would like to, produce, to, to present a joint prospective retrospective navigator that, uh, that only acquire, prospectively acquire the center of case space using the respiratory gating. The center of case space is the most important part of the case space, which contains the highest energy. So if I acquire the center of case space within five to 10 heartbeats, with respiratory gating, with navigator, then I would open up the gating window. I don't do any respiratory gating for the rest of case space. I can save time. Then I would have a combined motion corrected, motion corrected case space lines and motion corrupted case space lines. At the end, I would use a comprehensive sensing algorithm, a recent uh, uh, acceleration techniques that has been proposed in the field to detect the motion corrupted case space lines and to bring the image quality back to the original one. So to go to the detail of, we call our proposed algorithm COSMO, we call it compensation for motion correction. So to go to the detail of that, we look at the center of case space lines. As you can see, it contains the highest energy of the data. So we use the respiratory gating, the navigator, to acquire these case space lines within five, heart, five to 10 heartbeats, which is gonna be around, I would say, 10 to 20 seconds. If, uh, if uh, for example, assuming the heart rate is 60 bit per minute. And then we open up the, we don't do any respiratory gating. Basically, that narrow five minute gating window is, doesn't exist anymore. We accept all the data to save imaging time. Then I'm gonna acquire some of the data which are corrupted with motion. I have shown those in the red line. Retrospectively, when the scan is done, we're gonna go and select the data that are motion corrupted. We replace them with zero and we use the conference sensing to detect those uh, motion corrupted seg segments and to generate the final image. In that case, definitely I'm not prolonging the scan time twice. I'm finishing the scan at the right time. So for prospective uh, implementation of the algorithm, we went to the scanner and we changed the case space profile ordering to acquire the center within the five millimeter gating window. Again, within the 10 to 20 heartbeats, we suppress the respiratory motion using the narrow gating window of five millimeter. And then we open up the gating window to accept the rest of case space lines and to acquire the outer case space region, which has a very less amount of energy. And then we add up these two case space, acquired case space together to generate the semi-corrupted image. I call this semi-corrupted image because the center of case space is acquired without respiratory motion and the rest of uh, case space lines are acquired with the respiratory motion of the heart. Retrospectively, because we have the signal of the nav, we can choose or we can detect which of the lines has been corrupted with the respiratory motion the lines that are acquired at this position out of the end expiration. So we detect those, we replace those lines with zero to generate the zero field image. Again, the scan time is limited. We have not, we have, we have accepted all these lines that they would have been rejected using the conventional map. So we have this, we have saved the time. We detect the motion corrupted data, we generate the zero field image, and then we send the zero field image to the CS comprehensive sensing algorithm to, de to estimate the motion corrupted data and to generate the final image. So I'm gonna talk about the uh, comprehensive sensing in, a, uh, in, a, in a only one slide, basically. So comprehensive sensing is, has two main concepts. Basically, it's an iterative nonlinear image reconstruction. And it is based on the sparsity of the image. We assume that our image that we are estimating is a sparse in a given domain in a sparse, for example, in a wavelength domain, or in a Fourier domain, or in an image domain. That means that it has only a certain non-zero elements, and then the rest of elements are zero. And it has been shown that if I randomly undersampled my image, then I'm gonna have the 
aliasing artifact. My aliasing artifact is not coherent. For example, if you are using Sense or Grappa using, uh, for example, uh, Siemens, in Siemens, I am undersampling my case space in a regular fashion. I'm acquiring the case space every other line. Then if I look at my image, I would have a very coherent uh, aliasing artifact. Basically, it's going to repeat itself. That's not good for comparison sensing. Comparison sensing says that let's randomly undersample the case space data such a way that the aliasing artifact is like a noise interference artifact. So there is no coherency in the aliasing artifact. If it is like noise, noise uh, interference artifact, then I can remove them, I can threshold them out using the L1 minimization to extend out the non-zero element. So basically that's the idea behind the conference sensing. So I have two stages in conference sensing. What, one is data consistency that makes sure that the image that I'm estimating and that's why I'm estimating. If I take the Fourier inverse, go to K space, and if I look at the undersampled K space lines, the ones that I have been acquired using an undersampled pattern, it should be the same as the one that I have been acquired on the scan. So this is called data consistency. Plus the enforced sparsity term, that I know that my image is sparse in a given domain, let's say wavelength domain, so I can threshold out the noise-like artifact and to stand out in my image. So basically it's an iterative algorithm that iterates between these two uh, uh, stages. And it's because it's non-linear, it's gonna take a long time. It takes around two to three minutes, two to three, three hours to reconstruct the image for each coin. Okay, so I have my reconstruction working fine, but the other thing I have to do on this scanner is to prospectively change the K-space profile ordering. This is the somehow K-space profile ordering that we acquired on the Philips scanner. On the first, at the beginning of the scan, I acquired the center of K-space line. It has been shown in the white color, within the five millimeter gate emitter, within the 10 to 20 heartbeats. And then after that, I acquired the rest of the K-space line, the outer K-space line, which has been shown in the uh, gray color. As you can see, I have I collected some outer K-space point here in the white color. I had to collect those for the eddy currents artifact. I cannot jump from one case space line to the other case space line freely because that would cause a current artifact due to changing the gradients. So I have that implemented. Then we can uh, study, uh, we can perform a phantom study to evaluate the performance of the Cosmo. We had a moving heart phantom in our station mimicking the respiratory motion. It also mimics the cardiac motion, but we are not using it right now. So what we did is that we program a respiratory motion of a patient, of a healthy volunteer on the phantom, and then we use phantom to, uh, to see the performance of the Cosmo. First, we acquired the conventional uh, 3D SSFE image from the phantom to look at the image and to use it as a golden standard. That image took around 10 minutes because we had to reject the motion corrupted case space line that I acquired outside the five million gate window, know, these regions, these lines. And then we have to reacquire this. And then we use Cosmo algorithm. So in Cosmo we only acquire the 10 to hard, 10 to 20 heartbeats gated and then we open up the gating window to accept the rest of case space lines and you can appreciate we have a semi corrupted image because the center has been acquired without motion, the outer case space has been acquired with motion. So we have some motion artifact. Then we generate the zero field image. We just uh, uh, replace the motion corrupted case space line with zero to generate the zero field image. And then we send the zero field image to CS loss algorithm to uh, estimate the motion corrupted case space lines and to enhance the, or to improve the image quality. You can appreciate the image quality is the same as the prospectively gated. It's comparable, but the image acquisition time is half. So we can save the imaging time. But the imaging, I mean, the, the time that I have image probably is going to take to reconstruct these images using CS algorithm. It's going to take two hours to reconstruct these images. To evaluate the Cosmo on a healthy volunteer and to see how Cosmo works, we basically we have to perform, a, 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 to st uh, I'm sorry, to, to see the, or to evaluate the Cosmo and to efficacy of the Cosmo, basically, we have to make sure that the data set that we are acquired was, are random because the main condition that conference sensing works fine was the randomly acquiring the case baseline such a way that the noise, the 
aliasing artifact is like a is, is like a noise interference. So I have to see that the randomness that I get due to the respiratory motion is good enough for compress sensing. And also I have to check if my images are sparse in a given domain or how compress sensing is good to estimate the motion corrupted case response. To study those two, we perform a retros uh, uh, retrospective study on uh, 10 healthy volunteers. We, acquire, we use the ECG-gated SSFV sequence to look at the right coronary artery of 10 uh, uh, healthy volunteers, seven female in the range of 25 uh, year old. And then we repeated the scan 10 times to have a, to, so that we can perform a retrospective study, we can see the randomness of the KA space per 10 averages that we have. For each of the acquisition, we continuously assort the NAV data and case-based data. So this is one of the case-based data that I acquired from one of the healthy volunteers. You can appreciate the center is acquired without motion, and some of the other case-based lines are acquired without motion due to the respiratory motion. And some of the lines that are acquired with motion, I replace them with zero. This is from the first average. And I have from, I have looked at all through the 10 averages. To see the randomness, I look at the marginal distribution of these case based lines by averaging over the time. And these show you the marginal distribution of each case based line. You can appreciate the center has the probability of one. That means, as, that means that the center of case space has been acquired in each of the averages. And the rest of case space line has a probability of around 0.5. That shows the marginal, that, good, that shows a good marginal distribution of random distribution of the other case based lines that I can use in CS for image reconstruction. I repeat this over four volunteers, and again, you can see the center has a probability of one. Yes, we, we, we expect that to see that because we forced the scanner to acquire the center within the gate in middle without the respiratory motion. And the other case space has the probability around 0.5 because we sometimes acquire them within the gate in middle, sometimes not due to the respiratory motion. That, that randomness, we use this kind of randomness, which is good enough in the CS to reconstruct our images. In the next step, what we do, what we did was that we retrospectively go and correct for the respiratory motion of all those 10 volunteers within different gating window of three, five, seven, ten, 10, to have a reference. And then we use conference sensing algorithm to estimate the images and to compare with the retrospectively gated images. As you can see, the right coronary artery is very well delineated in Cosmo, and they are very, very comparable. Also, we asked two cardiologists to read our images in a blind uh, fashion, and then to score them. And then the, for the visual scoring, we didn't see any statistical difference between the motion, between the compress sensing images and the retrospectively gated images. That was a promising result, and then we went forward to perform a prospective study. So we recruit a healthy volunteer, and we prospectively acquire the Cosmo whole heart acquisition with isotropic resolution of 1.3 millimeter square. The Cosmo acquisition finished in 12 minutes, and you can see this is a semi-corrupted image of the right coronary arteries. And then when we use compress sensing to estimate the motion corrupted case space lines and to generate the image, you can appreciate that how the coronary artery got delineated and it gets the signal back. The projected acquisition time, if we were have to use the conventional navigator technique or sequence technique would have been 22 minutes. So you can appreciate that we could reduce the scan time by half by having the similar image quality. That shows another image from another healthy volunteer. You are looking at the axial image and the cross-section of the right coronary artery in semi-corrupted data that is acquired by Cosmo. And this is showing you the compress sensing image that we use to correct for the motion corrupted case, to estimate the motion corrupted case response. You can appreciate the semi, again, the cross section of the right coronary artery is more delineated and sharper compared to the semi corrupted. The scan acquisition time for this volunteer was 10 minutes, but the projected acquisition time using the conventional technique would have been 23 minutes. Again, you are here, you are looking at the distal region of the right coronary artery in the, in the, in the Cosmo image when we use compress sensing to estimate the case response, and this is in the semi-corrupted image. Again, you can appreciate the delineation of the distal region. 
So as a conclusion, we show that Cosmo is a promising technique that finishes scan time in a given time. It doesn't prolong its scan time to us. And also, it has it preserves the image quality. So maybe it's going to be useful to bring that 10% of the patient that we couldn't image in that multi-center back to the study and increase the sensitivity and the specificity of the Korean MRI. That remains to be seen. Also, as a future work, we can use, we can combine Cosmo with more, uh, more uh, fascinated techniques to uh, improve the image quality. One way would have been to use adaptive gating window. In the images that I show you, we use a constant five millimeter gating window to, cor to, cor to suppress the respiratory motion of the heart in the center of K-space region. Five millimeter could still be long, right? Because due to how heavy breather you are, if you breathe within five millimeter, you are not gating at all, right? So I'm not suppressing respiratory motion at all. I cannot reduce the gating window to one millimeter because the scan may not finish due to the very small drift then I cannot uh, finish the scan. So what we have proposed is that to use the adaptive gating window. Rather than to put a fixed five millimeter gating window, let's go and put a fixed gating efficiency, a scan efficiency. Let's say I would like to accept 10% of the data. If you would like to accept 10 to 30% of the data, that means that the size of your gating window would have changed automatically during the scan to make sure that the scan is gonna finish on the, same, on the, on the predictable time and then the drift is gonna be more robust to the drift because it's gonna follow your breathing pattern and then it's gonna finish the scan, I may end up having some respiratory motion. So this is the images that we acquire using a gating window fixed five millimeter that end up having the gating or scan efficiency of 55%. You can appreciate the right coronary artery, left ascending uh, LAD here. And then we repeat the scan with the gating efficiency of 30% that had the mean gating window of three minutes. You can appreciate that if we can reduce the gating window to three or two, we can even have a sharper images. So I can combine this with the Cosmo for the center of case space to make sure that I'm suppressing the respiratory motion even better using the adaptive gating window. The other uh, technique that we can combine the with Cosmo is to correct for the motion corrupted case space lines. At the moment, Cosmo replay, re I mean, threw away the motion corrupted case space line. They threw them, they replaced them with zero. However, we can go and correct them and help Cosmo even better to, uh, to, to, to reconstruct the more reliable images. So one way to correct for the case space lines is to beam the respiratory motion. So if I have the respiratory pattern, I can have, for example, 15 beams. Let's say we have a 15 beams. Beam number one, look at the case space lines acquired at the end expiration. And we go through to beam number 15, case space lines that, uh, that are acquired at the beginning of inspiration. Then I would have 15 case space. Each of those case space are randomly sampled due to the respiratory motion. If I combine all these case space together, I would have a motion corrupted image because some of the case space lines are acquired at this position, at this respiratory cycle. Some of the case space lines are acquired at the end expiration. So if I combine those together, I would get a motion corrupted image. And we know that respiratory motion shows itself as a ballooning and ghosting artifact. But we saw that the respiratory motion can also be modeled by the translation parameters, right? It was mainly a translation along superior inferior direction. And the translational motion can only affect the phase of K-space. It doesn't affect the magnitude. If I have a translation in a, in an image space, that means that I'm modulating the phase of, the phase of my K-space lines. So if I can estimate the translation parameter, here I would have 15 translation parameters to estimate. Each trans translation parameter for each beam. If I can have the correct translation parameters and I modulate the case space lines of each uh, these randomly undersampled uh, case space uh, data, then I can, if I, these translation parameters are correct, then I should have the sharpest image possible because I'm removing the ghosting and blurring artifact. So if I have a sharpest measure that can detect the sharpest of my image, I can optimize my translation parameters. So we come up with an optimization algorithm. 
such a way that it goes to estimate the translation parameter T1 to 250 15, reconstruct the image, look at the image sharpness. If the image sharpness is perfect, okay, exit the iteration. We have the sharpest image, we cannot do further. But if the sharpness is not maximized, go and update your translation parameter again to correct for the respiratory motion of the heart, specifically at the end beams, and then to generate the image. We repeat that until we get the sharpest image. This assumes that you're working with a, a fixed plane, so you have to have some kind of plane tracking in order to make this work. To show the this is that's a very good point. This is a retrospective uh, acquisition. So we are not doing any plane tracking. So we have a 3D acquisition very uh, uh, with a very high field of view to cover the heart when the heart goes up and down. And then we go and retrospectively correct for the, uh, there is no tracking involved in this. We go and retrospectively correct for the acquired motion. So it's not just translation. It's, it's translation. Yeah. A static region. Yes, that's one of the drawbacks because it's not pure translation. That's, I'm going to talk about this in a second. Perfect point. So here is showing one image that we acquired the reference image within the 5 millimeter gating window. And then these show you the motion corrupted image. When we open up the gating window, there is no respiratory gating. We acquire the image without any prolonging scan time. You can appreciate that the LED and LCX are totally fade out due to the respiratory motion. And then this is the motion corrected image when we use the sharpness measure as a similarity measure to detect the translation parameters. A good point that came out is that when I have a whole heart images, I have the images of the heart of the I would have the images of the heart and the chest fall and the back fall spin images in my field of view. So I don't have a pure translation parameter. It's going to be a non-rigid non-rigid translation, well, it's going to be a non-rigid uh, transformation because the static, I have a static region of the chest and the back wall that doesn't move. That static region would create some artifact in my images because when I'm correcting for the translation parameter, basically I'm correcting for the motion of the chest that doesn't move at all. That would create some artifact that would reduce the SNO. So that we can enhance this algorithm by basically changing or increasing the number of the parameter that we are estimating here by extending to affine transformation or non-rigid transformation to detect for the static region. To address uh, that point of uh, our fellow here, that, that, uh, that was a very good question, we come up with another technique to suppress the static region of the, uh, basically, the uh, static region of our field of view. So what we did is that before acquisition of our segmented 3D SSFE, we acquire a low-res image. We call it 3D lock because the, we have a localizer that localizes the heart, the motion of the heart before the acquisition. And then in the three directions, SI, superior, inferior, A, anterior, posterior, and right left direction. And then we use those information to suppress the static region first because we have a low-res image, and then to correct for the motion of the heart along three directions. This shows you the image of the low-res image. You can appreciate the heart and the right hemidiaphragm. I'll show you, this is the images that we acquired at each cardiac cycle. So if I have 100 cardiac cycle, let's say I'm gonna have 100 lowest image, I can go and segment the heart from the liver and from the chest and body because these are the 3D image, and then I can go and register them together. This is the registered image after the correction of the motion aligned superior, inferior, AP and right left. And then I can go and correct for the respiratory motion in the acquired case baseline. This show you one example. This work has been submitted for ISMRM this year, so we are hoping to get a good uh, result back. So this show you the images that we acquired, again, using the reference, five, seven millimeter fixed gating window. You can appreciate the right coronary artery and left system. This is the motion corrupted. When we didn't do any respiratory gating, you can see all the information is fade out. And here again, when we use the 3D lock information to estimate the motion of the heart, Allowing superior inferior uh, and true posterior and right left and correction co and correcting for those motion uh, in, in our acquired case based data. So all we talked about was uh, to enhance the coronary artery imaging for the detection of coronary, uh, uh, coronary artery disease. So we saw that we have a main limitation, which is a scan time in coronary MRI. So we try to come up with a new technique that reduces scan time 
preserve the image quality that hopefully can uh, increase the clinical value of uh, cardiovascular imaging and specifically coronary MRI in detection of coronary artery.